So this is week uh, three of the final week in the abortion series, and uh, just going to be up front, it's pretty sobering. It's a sobering series. It's a sobering message, and uh, I really appreciated um, Eric this morning. We do this, the talk through, then we do the, the, the walk through, where we kind of walk through the elements before the service, and he could read either me, the room, or whatever, that this last song that we were supposed to sing today did not fit the tone of this series or this certain message today so I appreciate that um, because it is a very sobering topic to talk about and it's uh, um, it's it's frustrating for me on many levels but it's something that we wanted to address with this series of abortion and talk about what God has to say about life in this issue so we switched up the songs a little bit today um, to reflect the mood and the tone, and I appreciate Gene and the worship team being willing to, to flex with that, and we're just going to allow God, the Holy Spirit, to speak to us today, to minister to us today in his words as we talk about this issue. So um, I, I'm just going gonna, gonna to speak it, say it, and um, hopefully I'm led by the Spirit to, and empowered to do it, but I'm going to say up front that abortion is, is not a political issue. We've made it a political issue. It is not a political issue. And I, th- I really believe and I'm conv- convinced, and I, I, I'm seeing this play out, where the enemy likes us to believe that this issue of abortion, the taking of an innocent life, uh, you know, unjustly, you know, is, is a political issue. And what we do then is we go back and forth between the sides. And we make it about our side is greater than your side. And and that's political. And we raise money towards these things to support the people. They're going to say what we want them to say. And it gets very political. So we've made it political. But at its core, abortion is is not a political issue. So abortion is a moral issue. It's an issue of morality. Abortion is taking a life of someone you know, the unborn, that's, that's innocent. It's unjust. And it, that is a moral issue. God tells us, thou shall not murder. And so we have done that Oof, to the tune of 55 million, at least 55 million babies aborted since 1973. And that number just continues. And, and we've seen a turn that yesterday was a year where that decision was overturned. And now it's up to the states. So we pray for the states and all those things that we, we get it right. But um, that's just overwhelming to think about. Overwhelming. Like, okay, it's not political. So now you got it's moral. People murdered. Like, God's life that he brought. And so for me, that's been very frustrating because it has entered the political realm. And so about a year ago, the Value Them Both Amendment came out. And, and so um, we, we, we talked about it here and we were criticized for it on different platforms, but um, it, we don't care. You know, we're, it's a moral issue. You know? And so we, we talked about it, we, we dealt with it, and then the vote happened. And then, so Kansas voted no, you know, and we were saying vote yes, value them both. We want to stop the abortion, uh, the, the rights of allowing abortion to continue and limit those rights. So yes was what we wanted to vote, and, and Kansas voted no, and what broke my heart was Harvey County voted no. And that broke my heart. And, and if you remember, it was a Sunday after I stood up here, and, and I was just just devastated I still am so but between between now now between then and and now so I've tried through prayer to shift my thinking saying okay that's discouraging but yet we have work to do so when Eric and I met in November I brought him along in this service sermon series design process for 2023 because now we know why, because he's going to be doing his own, which is cool. Um, I, I told him, I said, we got to talk about abortion. we got to talk about it. We've talked about it. We haven't talked about it. 
we've got to talk about it. Like, what is the biblical construct? And so Eric has done the first two weeks a great job with that. I'm going to finish it out today. But that's where this was born, and, and it's from a heart that's been broken. And I just, I kept saying, like, like for years, like, why, why do people allow that? Why do people lobby for this to happen? Why do they, why do they do it? Why do they allow it for to happen? Like, why? I, I just, I didn't get it for so long. I didn't get it, and then I did the research, and I realized, okay, people now, like, scientifically and medically, like, it is life begins at conception. That is just proven. It, it's proven. And people are now saying that, but here's, here's what they do. Those that support abortion, and they call it women's rights, my body, my choice. Here's what they, what they say. This is how they differentiate it. And um, I don't agree with it, but now, I, okay, okay. I at least understand it. What they do is they say is that, yes, this is life, okay, begins at conception, but there is a difference for them between a human life and a person. So, okay, if it's, as long as it's a human, you know, it's not yet a person. So I'm, I'm okay with that. So I did all the research on that, and no one, nobody could agree on Nobody could agree on when a human becomes a person. Why? Why is that? Because God says once they become a human, they are a person. There is no difference between a human and a person in the eyes of God. And God is God. And we look at his word. There's nowhere you can find in scripture where he, he differentiates between a human mass and a person. And so that's where we differ, and that's what we're going to look at today. So for God, it's clear in Scripture, I'm going to show you some things here, that, that life begins at fertilization at conception. That moment, that moment when the sperm and the egg, they, they, they meet each other, woo boom, person, a person that God has a name for. He already knows their name. We don't know it yet. He knows it. He knows everything. Boom, right then at that moment. So the main idea today is simply this. Personhood, okay? I'm not saying life. I'm saying personhood because it, it's a person. Person. Personhood begins at conception. Okay? I think we need that rhetoric personhood begins at conception because people would say on the other side of things yeah life begins at conception they, they would agree they have to agree with this medically and scientifically they would have to agree with that yet they distinguish between it's just a, a human not yet a person so that is what makes it okay but the main idea is this personhood begins at conception we're going to look at psalm 139 this morning, Psalm 139, I'm going to start with verse 13, I'm going to go to 18, and this is a psalm of David, and I love David, he's just outright honest with God, he tells it like it is, and uh, he does that here, and he gets, he gets into the area, and we're talking about this morning in verse 13, where he says, for you, he's talking to God, for you. For you, God, you created my inmost being. My inmost being, like, like kidneys, like the internal organs. We, we see the, the exterior, and God made that, but he also created and made and designed, incredibly, the interior. We think about the design of the human body, and some of you in the medical field, you know this. It is amazing incredible how God designed the intricate parts of our inmost being to make this happen. Incredible. There has to be a master designer. And David says there is a master designer and a creator, and it's God. He brought something out of nothing. And what's interesting is that, you know, with, with, we had the initial, right, Adam from dust, Eve from the rib, and then from that, he said, i got a better idea, you know, and the sperm and the egg come together, 
uh, fertilization, and that's how he creates life. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Many of you knit here, maybe you're knitting now, some of you do that during service, which is fine, I have no problem with it. Um, I'm a multitasker as well, ask my wife, <laughs> crazy. Um, but uh, so knitting, you know, there, there is something about knitting in the, the final project. And God starts at conception, fertilization, human DNA coming together, forming. God starts there and knits something beautiful together. Us, we are his masterpiece, his creation, knit together by God in the mother's womb. And David says in verse 14, because of this I praise you, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. By who? By God. Starting at conception, fertilization, boom, in the beginning, God made you fearfully and wonderfully. And some of you are here doubting how, doubting, you know, you, you know uh, your, your self-worth for whatever reason. Maybe people have told you things, they've said things, they've treated you certain ways. They've said things to you and treated you like trash. But I'm here to tell you that God, from the beginning of your existence, when that moment began, before the mom even knew that she was pregnant, God has a plan for you. He created you and you are wonderful in his eyes. Fearfully and wonderfully made by God. You know, uh, your works, he says, God, your works, they're wonderful, and I know that full well. My frame, or skeleton, was not hidden from you. And when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, the depths of the earth is a metaphor for the mother's womb. And God, God formed us from the depths of the earth. When nobody else could see us, God saw us. He created us and formed us. He says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book, which means God has a plan for us. From that moment of conception, God has a plan. In verse, actually, I think I missed the top of verse 16. This is actually very important. He says, your eyes saw my unformed body. And that's, that's significant, because that refers to the embryo. That is basically a formless mass. And people would, that's what they would say. So it's just, it's human, it's just a formless mass. It's nothing. But David makes it very clear, and now we have it as God's word, that God saw this formless mass. We were, we sitting here today, those out there, we are the formless mass that God had put together and, and created. You know, we came from that. Our DNA was a part of that because we are a person. And he saw that from the beginning, even as a formless mass. And it starts there and it brings us to where we are today. Actually, the cycle of life. And all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Verse 17, how precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. And when I awake, like when I awake every morning, I'm still with you. He was so overwhelmed by God's goodness, so overwhelmed, he understood, David understood who God was and what God did with him and how God from the beginning, even before, you know, his, his birth, you know, God had this all planned out. And why? Because personhood begins at conception. You know, we see the end product, but God starts before that. I want to make some observations on the text here today. The first one is this, is that God created us. Observation number one is that God God created us. And that word created means to bring something out of, out of nothing. And God does that. We're all created by God through this process 
of fertilization, conception, and then through uh, nine months or so, we are born, we enter into this world. And life began before that for us. God created us. Uh, Number two, we learn here that God not only created us, but God has designed us. Wonderfully complex. Uh, He has a, he has a, we all are are different in, in, in many ways. I think in Genesis 1.27, this is what links us all together though. We read in Genesis 27 from the beginning that God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God created us, God designed us in his image. So you and I, we are image bearers of God. We bear his image, which gives us value. We don't have value because I am who I am. I have value because I am who God made me to be in his image that he created me and designed me from from long ago, from way back, you know, before I was even a thought before, you know, my parents were even together. God knew about all this, and it's mind-boggling. God created us. He's creator. He creates life, and God designs us even from the beginning of conception, and we are to be his image bearers, and that's what gives us value, and that's what gives everybody value, whether we love them or like them or disagree with them or have issues with them. Everybody has value in God's eyes because they bear his image. And so we should treat others with respect, especially those not yet born. Treat them with respect. They are life. We might not be able to see them, but God sees them and knows them, creates them, is designing them. And we need to value them because they bear his image. We also see number three, the third observation here this morning is that God knows us. God knows all about us. And David was overwhelmed with God's thoughts that were towards him. And that's interesting for me is because I can hide things from you that you may never know, but God will always know. And yet he loves me and cares for me and and wants the best for me. And that's the same for you. And God knows the life that's conceived. You know, that process has began. And maybe there's not even a bump yet. Or not quite a heartbeat yet. But God is forming it. And molding it. And he, he, he knows that person so well. And he knows what's best. And what, what could be. And what should be. He knows all that because he is God and he's created that life. We also know here from the text that God values us. God places a value on all of us. Again, I don't don't care what you've been told or what you've heard about yourself. God has a value that he's placed on you and it's untouchable. It's his son, Jesus. Jesus came for you, me, and all of mankind. God loves us so much. He created us. We rebelled against him with our sin. We are in big trouble because of that. Big trouble. Messed up, broken people in need of a savior. And God says, I love you. I'm I'm gonna do it. But I gotta send my son, and he did, Jesus, to earth. And he gave his life for us. He died instead of us. Why? Because we have value to God. He made us, designed us, he knows us, he values us. He wants the best for us. And so if you have any question about your value to God, then you don't understand the good news of the scriptures. Is that we're sinners in need of a savior and God sent Jesus to rescue us. So if we believe in him, we can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. It's not what we do, it's what Jesus Christ did. And that gives us value. Makeup doesn't give you value. 
the nice clothes that you have, the house, the car, that doesn't give you value. What gives you value, what gives us value is what God has done for us. He sent Jesus for us. All those things I mentioned, you know, those things will kind of pass away. Those things will move on. They'll mean nothing to you one day. But what means everything to God is for you to be with him for all of eternity. So if you haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior, that's something you can do right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for me. I accept you as my Savior who did the work I could never do. That is the greatest thing you could do. And, and, and that, my friends, gives you value, not because of what you think or say, but what he did. God values us. And from that moment of conception, fertilization, when sperm and egg, boom, meet each other, and that begins, that process before anybody else knows. God wants to save that child and has a plan for them because he values them. Every person matters to God. And I know there's some pet people here and we have three cats and I'm not happy about it, but we have them. <laughs> but I gotta tell you, let just, people treat, people give pets more value than they do humans today. It, it, uh, it's a trigger for me, so I'm sorry if I lose it on, yeah. We have our, <laughs> it's a long story, but here we go. We need to value human life. That's what distinguishes us from, from animals, you know, is that we are a person created by God, designed by God, known by God, valued by God. And then, the fifth observation I clearly make from this is that God, God has a plan for us. He has a purpose for us. It's hard not to think about what could have been with all those millions of people. And I think that number's just in the U.S. That's just <laughs> what could have been. So I'm not going to camp on what could have been, but what can be. And that's the hope that we have. But we got to realize that whatever, and I'm going to get into this in a moment, but whatever the circumstance happened that this life was created, that life came to be, you know, God has a purpose and a plan for that life. That formless mass, which is a person that David acknowledged, that happens at fertilization and conception, that for, God has a purpose and plan that he wants to put into place. And so we begin to look now, you know, at these issues that we've made political. We begin to say, no, this is moral. That's why some of you, and including myself and the pastors and elders here, we are passionate about this issue. We're passionate about it. And because it's moral, because it has to do with God and not about us. We, we, indulge me for a moment. I kept thinking about this this week. Okay. This is good. Don't worry about the verses, Morgan. I'm just going to speed round it. This is interesting, okay? Verse 13. For you, he's talking to God. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Abortion is about me. You know, it's about us. Life is about God. Abortion is selfish. I don't like it. I don't want it. I don't need it. Life is about God and what he wants to do. And that just overwhelmed me as I read through this over and over this week, is that life is all about, God is all about life. And abortion just is a slap in the face because it's all about us. And we didn't get what we want. Our needs weren't met. It shouldn't be this way or whatever. And, and there's all kinds of issues and conversations to have around this. And we, and, and, and we had no intention to, to be able to handle them all in this three-week series. But life is about what God wants. And we should support it and go after it and proclaim it and live it out. And fight for it. I do want to make three 
action steps as we leave this morning. Three things I want to say that I think we need to, to be aware of and that we need to go after and we need to do. Number one is this, that we must trust God with this child. Because personhood begins at conception, we must trust God with this child. Um, I, I really tried to wordsmith this all over the place, and this is the, just the, the best way I could describe it. This child, what, who's this child? It's any child. We must trust God with this child. And, and so again, I know that there's all kinds of circumstances and issues, and there were accidents, and there were bad things, and there were all things that, that happened that, that contribute to this. And, and so, and it's like, what do I do? And society says that it's my body, it's my choice, so I don't want this child, and it's gonna be terrible if it lives with me because I'm a terrible person, and there's no hope for me, there's no hope for it, and so this is what I can do, and it's been allowed to do it, so I'm gonna find a way to do it and end, and end this life. And I'm here to tell you that, you know, keeping life and saying no to abortion takes faith. It takes faith. Trusting that God will do what he wants to do with this child. Again, he has a plan for this child. It might not have happened the way you wanted it to happen or thought it should happen, and it might be, you know, whoa, it's going to shake your world. And so the first thing you do is think about yourself and what you're going to have to say to your parents or friends or deal with society or school issues or the big plans you have. But you need to set that aside and say, okay, this did happen. I'm going to have faith in God because life begins or personhood begins at conception that he's going to take care of this child. And in, as a part of this church family, some of you have done that. You have taken on kids. You've adopted, you've done foster parenting and respite, you know, relief for kids who do foster, foster parenting. And, and, and you are heroes. You are amazing. And we can do, we could even do more of that. We have a ministry that started here many years ago that's called Oak Grove. And I don't think, there's very few that know where that came from. And I'm just going to briefly, quickly tell you where the ministry of Oak Grove came from. Now, Oak Grove is about really supporting those uh, that want to learn more about adoption, foster care, and then taking care of those who have adopted and are doing foster care and providing for, for families and for kids and really supporting them. So many years ago, we have a missionary, Scott Edgren, who will be here in a few weeks. Scott doesn't do anything with this ministry at all, but he's in Ecuador, Quito, Ecuador. He teaches at college campuses. And so we took a group of, of people from this church. I took, we, I took a group of people from this church. We went down to Quito, Ecuador, and we're like, okay, we're just going to sit in your classroom all day. So before we went, Scott said, we should probably do something else. So Chip, you can go and preach with me you know, at nights and, and different things like that, and I'll interpret for you, and that was fun. Um, but during the day, uh, there's an orphanage called For His Children, by Jen, led by Jen Schneider. And, 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 and we can, we can um, be a part of, of that ministry, and, and we can serve them and, and help them. And so we, we did that. Our team, we, we helped them, and we played with the kids, and, and we loved on those kids, and we learned so much about life and those kids came from different reasons and different backgrounds and and we took mostly you know women with us and so they wanted to take them all home and and uh it was just the funnest time it was so cool and when i came back i'm like god what do we do with this this did not happen by accident like you put us in this orphanage what are we supposed to do with it what am i supposed to do with it personally you know, we have five kids. You want us to adopt more kids? What do you want us to do? What do we do as a church with that? You know, do we foster? I, I don't know. So um, I just threw it out to the team. I'm like, hey, if, if God's telling you to do something based upon what you experienced at this trip, please let me know. So we had Sam and, um, Samantha and Bryce Roth. They're no longer uh, in Newton. They moved to Michigan a few years ago. Uh, they came to me, say, Pastor Chip, we want to meet with you. We want to talk to you about this trip. I'm like, okay, God's put us on us on our heart to start this ministry. We want to call it Oak Grove. And I'm like, why Oak Grove? Well, that's where they grew up. She grew up on Oak Street, and he grew up on Grove Street. So Oak Grove, great families. That's where that came from. 
Isn't that kind of cool? So great families, and they grew up in great families, and they want to help be a part of building great families. And so they started that ministry. Now, uh, they moved away, and Megan Denicky has taken that over. I thought I saw Megan somewhere. Megan's right there. Megan has a great team of people that, um, that uh, are helping those people connect to um, adoption or foster care or respite care, and they do have a ministry. I know they would like to do so much more, and, and it requires people and resources. So you could simply email Oak Grove at livingalegacy.church. So if you go onto our website, www. Dot, just kidding, it's a joke. Livingalegacy.church, you can find that connection. Okay, so you can simply email Oak Grove at livingalegacy.church, connect with Megan, and they can help you get connected and be a part of this ministry. And maybe God's calling you to, to be a part of foster care or adoption or respite care for those involved in that or, or whatever else, just helping kids. That's a good place to start. And we'd love to be able to continue to build this ministry because there is a big need now. You know? And this all comes back to the issue of, of faith, trusting God with the child, saying, okay, God, you're in charge. You're in control. We're going to give it to you. We're going to support life because personhood begins at conception. And we're going to value that life that you created, regardless of the situation or the circumstances. And so as a church, we need to really step up and to support that process and be willing to do what God's calling us to do. And that also will require faith. The second thing I want to leave you with it, leave you, with you is this, is that because personhood begins at conception, we must change our rhetoric. We must change our rhetoric and so you heard a lot, you hear a lot, and maybe you say it. I'll, I'll just lovingly disagree with you on it. But, you know, my body, my choice. My body, my choice. So you've heard a lot of that, and, and it's been a part of the media and the news, and that's the, the rally cry. Now, I'll say this, especially if you're a Christian. It, it, it might be your choice, but it's not your body. It's not. And, and, and this statement should really be on the lips in the heart and minds of no Christian. It's not a Christian statement, and I'll show you real quick here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where Paul says in verse 20, you were bought at a price. You believers were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Our body is not our own. It is his. We gave our life to Jesus. He is in charge. He wants to be the leader and Lord of our life. It's not our body. It might be our choice. It's not our body. And because it's not our body, it's his body. We do it all for him because of him. We need to now make decisions for life, not death or murder. And so it's really uh, a non-Christian statement to, to say that it's my body, my choice. I do what I want. And I know that ticks people off and people are ticked off with me by that. And that's okay. But you take it up with the creator of life himself. And you can deal with him one day. And you, and you will. And so we need to set the record straight. Our rhetoric, personhood, begins at conception. That formless mass that came together, boom. It's a miracle created by God. And so now we need to honor him with our bodies. And we need to trust him. And we need to do what he wants us to do. And it's choosing life. And the final thing I want to say about this issue this morning is this is that because personhood begins at conception, we must fight for the rights of this child. We must fight for the rights of this child. And we must take a stand as the church on this moral issue. This should get, us, this should get our, bud, our blood pumping. This, this should kinda, we should be angry in a righteous way over this. It's okay to be righteously angered about this issue, that God the Holy Spirit will allow you to express it appropriately. But this should, this should move us. This should shake us at our core as a church in this community that we voted against it and that we now must change the rhetoric. We must take a stand. We must 
do what we can do to fight for the rights of this child. They can't fight at this point. They can't fight. We fight for them. What's that called? It's called justice. It's about exercising God's justice and being their voice and taking a stand and speaking up and doing what we can do to promote life because personhood begins at conception and we must be their voice and we must speak loud and bold and very clear about this issue because it's not about us. They, Satan wants it to be about us. It's all about God and what he wants. And so we, we must make our voices known. It's okay to do that. Don't be afraid to do that. Silence is not a good thing. It can be a, a bad thing, especially with this issue. We must speak up in our schools. We must speak up in our congregations. We must speak up in our community. We must speak up about this issue because it's the right of a child that can't yet speak. I'm going to call the worship team up on the stage at this point, and as they come up, I want to tell you a true story about a girl in my youth ministry many years ago. Her name's Rachel. Rachel's a part of our youth ministry, kind of a, uh, a, a troubled child with all kinds of issues, uh, but came to our youth group and uh, had, had a good relationship with Rachel. And I remember um, it was towards the end of my work day. I was in the office, and I, I, I got a, uh, a call from one of Rachel's friends. And uh, she said, uh, you need to call Rachel. And I'm like, well, I need to call Rachel. You got to call Rachel because, because um, I just found out that she's, um, she's pregnant and she's going to have an abortion tomorrow. And I'm like, oh, brother. Oh, man. So then you get all this stuff. What do I say? What do I don't say? You know, will she listen? I think she'll listen. I don't know. So immediately, I'm sure I said a prayer. I immediately, I, I called Rachel. I'm like, I found out. Who told you? I don't, I, it doesn't matter. You can't do this. You will regret this. Trust me, Rachel. You will regret this decision. You cannot do this. And I begged and I pleaded and I, I asked her not to do it. And she was, she was so hardened. I was so sure that I could convince her. I was so sure that I could be the voice that she needed to hear in that moment that would say, no, I'm not going to do it. But I couldn't do it. I tried everything I could. And she was so hardened by it. So I did something that don't recommend. It wasn't the right thing to do at the time. I don't think. I don't know. But I just did it. I called her mom. Her mom had no idea. I said, your daughter's going to have an abortion tomorrow. I didn't know what else to do. Her mom was like, what? No. Rachel still had the abortion. She still had it. And I knew that it was going to be very difficult for her afterwards based upon what I knew uh, from other people. And what I've read about those who have an abortion, they begin this guilt thing and they turn to other things. And, and she did. She turned to hard drugs and uh, was of course, there if she ever needed me. Um, but she went through it. She hit bottom. And when she hit bottom, uh, she had nowhere else to go except God. She came back to church. Came back to church on Sunday morning. She just come to youth group. Now she came on Sunday mornings. She gave her life to Jesus. She believed and was saved. And I baptized her. Grace Church on the Mount. Baptized Rachel. It was amazing. It was incredible. She moved away to, to Michigan um, shortly afterwards, and I got a call from her mom, and the story in tragically. She uh, relapsed and overdosed, back into drugs, overdosed and died. And they asked me to be a part of her service, and I preached a part of it. And it was a sad story, sobering story. And it's a story that I know that's happening every single day in the lives of people that have made that decision. And maybe you've made that decision decision not to choose life or support someone that has chosen abortion and you're just beaten up over it. I'm here to tell you that God is so good and he's so loving and kind that he wants to forgive you. He will forgive you. He'll forgive you so that you now can tell a different story. You can tell a different story. So don't let this beat you up anymore. Allow it to move you 
to a place where you can give grace and love and kindness to people, where you can help people, because fighting people is not going to win this. Reaching their heart through love will win it. And so accepting them where they're at, loving them where they need to be, and offering that forgiveness that God offers you. So if you're here today and you have made these decisions not to choose life or supported someone who has not chosen it, I would say you need to kind of, conf- you need to confess, not kind of, kind of be nice, uh, you need to confess that to God and, and admit that to him and he will forgive you and set you free so that you can now tell a different story and, and really support life because personhood begins at conception. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. We give this word to you. Allow us to do something with it that will be for the good. And Lord, I pray that you would do an incredible work in this community, Lord. It needs to be done. Lives need to be changed. changed, Lord, and I pray that the biblical counsel will come across to them in a very powerful, mighty, incredible way that you would do the work that you, that you do best. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. We give this to you. And now we want to worship you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen.